Okay, so uh, today, today is the day when uh, this great uh, French painter died on, on February 13th. So I thought of uh, uh, creating quickly some kind of uh, uh, incipient uh, uh, material uh, about a possible uh, uh, reflection between his painting and architecture in general. And I will focus particularly on, on the relationship between uh, spirituality and sensuality, which is also present in his paintings. <clears throat> this was the man. Uh, this is uh, Georges Rouault, uh, and uh, he's very famous for his paintings, but also for his prints. I think he was a very complex uh, uh, artist, and uh, he deserves to be known uh, uh, very well, I think. So Georges Henri Rouault uh, was born uh, uh, in May, but died on the 13th of February 1958. Was a French painter, draftsman, and print artist <clears throat> whose work is often associated with fauvism and expressionism. That's why I chose to also show the works of a few expressionist architects. Uh, but by the way of this, I have to say that I searched for uh, fauvism in architecture, and there is no such a thing. So it's very interesting now that uh, we have uh, fauvism in painting and perhaps, well, mainly in painting, but no, in a, not in architecture. But I think the idea to explore a fauvism in architecture could be a potentially a fruitful one. Uh, fauve architecture would be, I think, an interesting uh, addition to the uh, many otherwise movements and currents in architecture. And I just show some paintings by him. He was a mystic, but he was also, he was a mystic who painted both saints, Christ included, and prostitutes. Uh, sorry, I, I, I wanted initially to uh, intercalate, uh, to have images of his paintings, and then images of an architecture of the present, uh, um, uh, mainstream architecture, which in my opinion is the opposite of his paintings, because it is uh, uh, without nerve, without fervor, without blood, without flesh, and without spirit. Most of the architecture that we build today is so-called civilized, but perhaps is too civilized in the sense that it became almost frigid. <clears throat> but his paintings are not frigid at all. Uh, Christ, but is a Christ you know, a melancholy Christ. And I, I, I like his paintings very much because uh, you know, they, they, even when he deals with a so-called religious theme, he's uh, still uh, uh, a, a painter who uh, uh, addresses life in its uh, viscerality as well, not just in its uh, ghostly, um, so-called, um, uh, you know, ethereal uh, longings. He also painted clowns. So he has uh, uh, his uh, his universe is about uh, um, you know various aspects of reality, <clears throat> but I would say that his his uh, his perception perce perceptions of life seem to be centered around these themes: uh, Christ, uh, the saint, uh, the clown, and the prostitute. Uh, but there are there is more to it. It's, it's 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 some kind of a primal. You see this primal landscape and look at that sun uh, insinuating itself in a mystical way on 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 the sky. Uh, he, he was also, I would say, some kind of an existentialist, a crucifixion, um, um, a portrait of a lady, uh, another. Well, maybe it's a detail from the the painting I showed earlier. Um, to women, um, then here we have uh, three three characters. He he seemed to to, to like the, the the theme of three people uh, together. But in religion, uh, Trinity, of course, the triad uh, has a certain meaning. Uh, so, I think his art uh, creates the conjunction, the bridging bridge between various uh, various fields. Uh, this is a self portrait. But uh, you can understand from his uh, the expression of his face <clears throat> that he was a, a would call today a, a troubled man, a melancholy. Maybe he had, I mean, most surely his own disappointments. 
like all of us do. Um, I think his painting is uh, has is rich, is complex, and uh, addresses various uh, various sides of life. It seems, and and it, it, uh, his paintings also look a little bit like like him. Um, I mean, I, I see his self portrait in, in in several characters that he painted. Again, a crucifixion. Uh, then we have uh, you know. Uh, sensuality uh, we have again uh, figures uh, looking at us three clowns um, you know staring at us uh, we have even anticipations of uh, you know uh, forms of expression is that uh, uh, lean almost was the cooning um, but why why did I try to relate Rouault with architecture? Because I think architecture today, in good measure, misses the two maybe major uh, sides or components of his painting, spirituality and sensuality. It's true that the sensuality in his case achieves uh, levels of, of what might be called uh, promiscuity like here, for example, the very fact that he, he uh, you know, was, was preoccupied by the subject of depicting uh, prostitutes, but, but here is the same man. So here is Ruo, and here is Ruo. So we have, there is also guilt, the primordial guilt. There is uh, clearly uh, spirituality and the quest for spirituality, but there is also, you know, the, the other side. And um, so I, I was preoccupied with, with thinking about the two themes, sensuality and spirituality, or spirituality and sens sensuality in architecture. Both are neglected today, although we live in a so-called liberated world, but I think our buildings very rarely achieve that kind of um, almost pagan uh, sensuality that uh, uh, the truth of the earth, in a way, uh, claims or, or, or reclaims. You, you know, this. Uh, I searched on, on uh, Google Images for promiscuous architecture or lascivious architecture, and I couldn't find anything. Nobody thought of... I, I found one or two projects, and I will show them to you a little bit later. Anyway, there is also, there is also a cosmic quality in a way, because when you clash, because it's about uh, clashing, it's a clash between spirituality and sensuality, you get some kind of a turmoil there. It's a conflict. And it's a conflict, uh, but that conflict could be very, very uh, um, genuine and, uh, and uh, intense and uh, uh, fruitful. And the, the possible um, the cosmic uh, uh, undertones uh, uh, could show up. Anyway, um, so again, what, what painter paints something like this and then paints a crucifixion? Or the judges, here you have the judges, you know, the, 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 the carriers of, of uh, you know, uh, ethical uh, evaluation. He also painted uh, sometimes flowers, uh, but not as frequently. I would say that the two main themes of his work are um, um, spirituality and, and sensuality. And uh, there is also in some of his portraits, I would say that there is, although he was a French painter, but I think I see something Byzantine a little bit. Um, uh, I'm thinking of the mosaics of uh, um, in Ravenna, San Vitale, or um, there is a certain mysticism there that that it is Christian, but uh, but uh, um, you know from a, a much earlier from a much earlier time. That's why I thought that perhaps I should talk also about Justinian. I'm really complicating my 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 time and my my uh, my theme because starting from Rouen, I would like to show Justinian architecture, then uh, Otto Barding, uh, Rudolf Steiner, and Hans Pelzig, uh, three very important expressionist architects, and then 
show uh, uh, a sketch, a beginning of a material uh, with a title, Erotic Architecture. <clears throat> but all in all, the, his paintings, I think, have this, this, uh, this force, this power uh, that uh, very rarely, I, I would say, is present in architecture because architecture is so dedicated to the so-called civilization and it, 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 it loses the chance to also express uh, um, uh, existential, existential uh, dilemmas or, uh, you know, uh, even uh, spiritual dilemmas. We, we, we don't think about these matters. We just think about functions and to erect a building that uh, functions in a certain way. But I, I think culture is much more complex. And uh, painting is able to evoke this complexity much better than, than architecture. So now very quickly, if you allow me, I will go to uh, Justinian architecture because I mentioned it. And uh, yes, this is an attempt that, uh, at cultural conjunction that maybe uh, uh, is, um, you know, is, is just, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, I, what, what did I do here? I was supposed to open uh, uh, Justinian architecture. Okay. Uh, from beginning. Why is it keep showing? I don't understand why, why it keeps showing this one. Uh, I'm agitated because, um, Okay, Justinian architecture, okay, here. All right, it works now. Now, from uh, Georges Rouault, we go back uh, a lot of time, uh, many centuries, architecture under, under uh, the Justinian's reign. Uh, uh, and this is the emperor Justinian. Uh, so he was, uh, he lived between 482 and 565 was also known as Justinian the Great, was the Eastern Roman Emperor from 527 to 565. So almost 100, uh, 500, uh, well, more than 1,500 years ago. Uh, his uh, uh, time when he was an emperor was marred by the ambitious, but only partly realized Renovatio Imperi or restoration of the empire. Uh, a still more resonant aspect of his legacy was the uniform rewriting of Roman law, the Corpus Juris Civilis, which is still the basis of civil law in many modern states. His reign, uh, reign, reign I, I mean, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word, uh, word, unfortunately, also marked the blossoming of Byzantine culture. And that's why I thought of showing this, because there is something uh, in, in the paintings of, of, uh, of um, Rouault that uh, makes me think of the Byzantine culture and his building program yielded works such as the Hagia Sophia. He's called Saint Justinian the Emperor in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, because of his restoration activities, Justinian has sometimes been known as the last Roman in mid 20th century historiography. He was married to Empress uh, the Theodora uh, who came from a poor background, but uh, she was a great um, empress. Uh, here she is. And I, I, I do, maybe you see too, a certain relationship between the, the, the painting, some, some of the paintings by Rouault, the frontal, uh, the frontality, almost by dimensionality. It, 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 I, I see it connected with, with um, uh, some, some parts of the Byzantine culture. Theodora was an Eastern Roman Empress by marriage to the Emperor uh, Justinian. She became Empress when Justinian's accession in 1527 was one of his chief advisors, albeit from humble origins, along with her spouse. Theodora is a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church and in the Oriental Orthodox Church, commemorated in, in, in those two days. Okay, architecture. So Justinian was a prolific builder. The historian Procopius bears witness to his activities in this area. Under Justinian's reign, reign uh, the San, Vit San Vitale in Ravenna, which features two famous mosaics representing Justinian and Theodora, was completely, completed under the sponsorship of Julius Argentarius. The, this is not the emperor. San Vitale in Ravenna, which is one of the, the you know, it, it is impossible to come across a history of architecture without showing the San Vitale. 
the Basilica of San Vitale is a late antique church in Ravenna. The sixth century church is an important surviving example of early Christian Byzantine art and architecture. It is one of eight structures in Ravenna inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Its foundational inscription describes the church as a basilica, though its centrally planned design is not typical of, of, of the basilica form. And here it is. It is glorious indeed in its, in its uh, old age and, and, and primal truth. Uh, and the interior is sublime. And uh, you would say, what does this have to do with Rouen? It does, I think, uh, in a, because you saw the paintings of, of Christ and, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is, although you might say it's a, it's a forced uh, relationship. I, I don't know. I, I, like, uh, I like sometimes to uh, attempt bridges that seem to be um, uh, at first uh, almost impossible to, uh, to build. Um, because I think through uh, uh, the past, the so-called past doesn't pass. The, the real so-called past doesn't pass. It's not something that, that was. It's something that was, is, and will be if it is significant, if it was lived intensely and meant something. And uh, in that sense, I think the painting of Rouault connects somehow with, with what we see here, these mosaics of, uh, in San, uh, San Ravenna, in uh, San Vitale in Ravenna. It's a glorious building and it's a glorious art and uh, it must be beautiful to attend the concert there, no doubt. But you, you look at the eyes of, 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 uh, of, of these two uh, uh, almost sublime characters and we saw the eyes on the faces of, uh, of Rouault's paintings. It's almost the same expression, wandering, you know, in front of a life which is still unknown and maybe eternally unknow unknowable. Uh, the plan of uh, San Vitale, um, uh, again, I keep, uh, um, no, no, it is San Vitale. I'm, <laughs> sometimes I feel like saying uh, uh, something else and um, uh, feel like saying San Ravenna, but no, it's San Vitale in Ravenna. Anyway, uh, spirituality. Uh, there is here, here there isn't much sensuality, it's spirituality. Although when you look at the plan uh, and the centrality, the roundness of the building, I think any great architecture, because it is vital, uh, <laughs> it's called San Vitale, because it is vital, it should have something biological in it, if not uh, uh, more than that, if there is something more than that, probably not. Um, he also worked for Haji Sofia. Maybe I shouldn't show also Haji uh, Sofia. Uh, Sofia um, I, I think we already saw a certain possible connection with uh, with uh, with Ruo and let's focus on Ruo. So I will go now to expressionist architecture because uh, besides the Byzantine connection, there is the, 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 the obvious connection with expressionism because Ruo was also uh, was an expressionist painter. He was a fauve, but he was also an expressionist painter. And I will show now uh, expression three important expressionist architects. Uh, the first one I'm going to show is Hans Pölzig. Um, this was a presentation I, 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 I prepared some time ago, uh, started with Kevin Roch, which has nothing to do with, with uh, Hans Pölzig, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Hans Pölzig, uh, a German architect, a very important German architect with a powerful expressionist elements in his work. There, are, there is also Fritz Höger and there are others, but uh, I, I will talk about uh, three of them. So Hans Pölzig, uh, he, he, you know, lived, he was a contemporary of Georges Rouault. He probably would have never thought that uh, one day there will be a talk about him and, uh, and, and Rouault. Uh, this was the man um, drawing, uh, thinking, uh, feeling some drawings, 
uh, you look at his drawings, it's, they are maybe not as powerful graphically or pictorially as the paintings of Rouault, but uh, still they show skill and, uh, you know, expressionism like here. Even here, I would say it's, it's expressionism, but it's also erotical. This image, this kind of space with this single column in the center, I, I would say this is a, a, an erotical space. It's not a promiscuous space. It's not a lascivious space, but it does have uh, elements of, of sensuality. Um, right now, of course, it's an attempt to, to I just, I just uh, uh, brainstorming in a way uh, or heartstorming. I, I'm just uh, moving around in circles around the theme, the theme starting from, from the pretext of Rouault and exploring other ways of doing architecture. Because I think our architecture today is often uh, deprived of that uh, earthiness, that rawness that uh, Zaha Hadid aspired towards, but in my opinion, didn't achieve. Maybe if she lived longer, she would have, I don't know, or if she had a kitchen in her apartment, because I know in her apartment in London, she didn't have a kitchen. And uh, in a way, I understand why, because she, 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 she hated probably the, the, the association between the kitchen and womanhood or a woman. And I understand that very well, but, but an apartment without a kitchen is, uh, I don't know. Um, and I am far from <laughs> being very appreciative of kitch chicken, ch kitchen, ch kitchens. <laughs> kitchens or chickens, I always have this trouble with chicken and kitchen, but you understand. Anyway, Hans Pelzig, nature, buildings, uh, sulfuric acid factory in Poland, look at this. It's, it's an almost an ominous architecture. And I would say the paintings of Rouault are also at least in part ominous. Uh, it's expressionist architecture, but I think it is powerful. Um, this, uh, anyway, this is a build, I go quickly over it. Uh, these are, he also built within the city and they are not so uh, uh, telluric or uh, some stage design for their golem for uh, the movie. I mean, this is a Gothic, this is Gothicism. It's, it's a Gothic uh, sensibility at work here. And um, the Gothic could be perhaps uh, associated uh, to an extent with uh, um, what I meant by the duality or dichotomy, even spirituality and, and sensuality. The irrational, no, the eruption of the irrational. Um, the dark, the dark forces, golem, um, you know, the visceral, the visceral, the, the vortex, the, uh, the uterus, the womb is, the, is dark here. Is, 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 these are spaces of, of darkness, of fear. Uh, there is blood, there is death, but there is also, uh, you, you know, uh, an eros which uh, often is associated with Thanatos. With, with death. And then we have the building, this incredible building, which unfortunately was destroyed, uh, will we'll arrive at that building. Some water towers, we already saw some images, but even these water towers are uh, have a certain darkness about them. Uh, and, and also a certain uh, uh, sensuality, if we consider their forms. Um, so they, they, they are just water towers, but uh, I, I think they are architecture. They are not just uh, you know, so-called buildings. So this is Hans Pölzig. And uh, um, once we arrive at that theater that was, uh, unfortunately, again, this is a, it's, it's too ample the subject. I will go quickly because I, we, I, I would like to have an overview of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a theme, and I don't want to get lost in, in too many details about these particular architects. This is the Grosses Schauspielhaus in Berlin, uh, which unfortunately was destroyed. And this building, uh, yes, you would say there is no relationship at all between this building and, and the Georges Rouault, but I do see it because it is uh, um, uh, because of its expressionism 
and also because of its uh, theatricality and because of the, the, the vertical dimension, the light coming from the top, is, 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 it has almost a, a, some kind of a spiritual uh, meaning. Uh, this is another building designed by him, but it was never built. And the back to, the, the, to the, this theater, which unfortunately was built, uh, was, was destroyed. And, uh, and uh, I understood at one point it was all painted in red. So you can imagine this, this, this was a very powerful, uh, uh, you know, sensuous, uh, uh, almost mystical experience inside this theater. And we see here now that column that uh, supporting uh, one central column here, there is a row of them. Um, a very seminal, important work by, uh, by Hans Pelzig, which unfortunately was ruined, was destroyed, was demolished. And I wonder for what reason, because it escaped the war. Okay, now we go to Rudolf Steiner. Uh, or should I go to Barning? Yeah, let's mention a little bit, uh, but Otto Barning, I didn't get. Uh, no, he's not here, but I, I have him. I'll go to Rudolf Steiner. Uh, Rudolf Steiner, maybe you know of him. He was um, uh, a very important uh, philosopher who also built, uh, and he built several buildings. And uh, um, what is going on here? Sorry. Um, Confused. Just a second, please. Rudolf Steiner. Okay, I know what is happening. Uh, Rudolf Steiner, uh, a philosopher, uh, but but a very interesting philosopher. So he was uh, born. Uh, actually, will will uh, will pay homage to him on the 25th or 27th of February. Actually, on the 27th of February when he was born. Although I see there are two dates, but I'll I'll settle for the 27th. Was an Austrian philosopher, social reformer, architect, esotericist, and claimed clair, claimed clairvoyant. Stein, Steiner gained initial recognition at the end of the 19th century as a literary critic and published philosophical works, including the philosophy of freedom. At the beginning of the 20th century, he founded an esoteric spiritual movement, Anthroposophy, with roots in German idealist philosophy and theosophy. Other influences include Goethe and science, and uh, Rosie Christianism. You know, the paintings of Rouault have, in my opinion, a strong mystical side. Uh, they have a clear uh, uh, interest in, in, in spirituality with his depictions of crucifixions and Christ and clowns that look sometimes like saints and saints that, who look sometimes like clowns. Sorry, I said something which I should not have said. Please forgive uh, the last phrase. Uh, and then uh, uh, sensuality, which is almost an interdicted social. Uh, uh, sensuality. In the first uh, more philosophically oriented phase of this movement, Steiner attempted to find a synthesis between science and spirituality. His philosophical work of these years, which he termed spiritual science, interesting conjunction, no? You wouldn't think of science of being spiritual, but that's what he attempted to arrive at. So to apply the clarity of thinking characteristic of Western philosophy to spiritual okay. questions. Differentiating this approach from what he considered to be uh, vaguer approaches to mysticism. In a second phase, beginning around 1907, he began working collaboratively in a variety of artistic, uh, uh, please be kind and turn off the microphone, uh, of artistic media, including drama, the movement arts. I, I hear a, an echo. I don't know if it's because of my machine here or not. Um, <laughs> I, I hear something. Uh, I have to turn off the microphone. I'm sorry. Uh, oh. <sighs> sorry, Joanna. Um, Okay, so um, 
now I'm a little bit uh, lost here, in a second phase of uh, Rudolf Steiner, beginning around 1907, he began working collaboratively in a variety of artistic media, including drama, the movement arts and architecture, culminating in the building of the Goetheanum. And you are going to see some of the buildings he built. Um, I don't know what's, okay. Uh, this was the man, uh, Rudolf Steiner, a philosopher, but he built some very interesting buildings. Uh, and not so few. Uh, um, the need for imaginations, a sense of truth and the feeling of responsibility. These three forces are the very nerve of education, he thought. I hope you remember that we remember this. The Goetheanum, uh, he built two. The first Goetheanum was like this, but it burned down and uh, uh, was a timber and concrete structure designed by Rudolf Steiner. He attempted the synthesis of diver diverse artistic media and sensory effects infused with spiritual significance. Again, it is the spiritual significance that made me uh, think of Rudolf Steiner by the way of, uh, of um, uh, Georges Rowe. This is the building, the second uh, Goetheanum uh, and, and there is spirituality, but there is also, I would say, sensuality because of the curvature of the, of, of the walls. Uh, this is a chimney of a technical building, so to speak, but quite uh, fantastic in its uh, expression. Um, well, it, it took a philosopher to be like this, you know, because architects trained for many years in an architecture school are uh, discouraged to, to, to build in, in this way or to imagine buildings in this way. A transformer house, uh, <laughs> he built both. And the Goetheanum is on the right and this the transformer's house that you see uh, on the left. Uh, so this is the second Goetheanum, uh, and quite an impressive uh, structure. Uh, anyway, there are there is plenty of information about Rudolf Steiner um, uh, on, on the web. Um, he, we could talk, by the way, of him of anthroposophic architecture. This was the first Goetheanum, uh, and uh, and uh, it is clear here that he has spiritual concerns, but he also was attracted by biology. This is a kind of architecture, it is a kind of architecture which I miss. Uh, these days, yes, we have uh, fluidities, we have curves, we have, uh, we can do a lot with parametrics and scripting and programming and so on. But what is missing, I think, is a certain, I call it darkness, which has to do with a, a certain level of tectonics and with a, maybe a different um, cosmological uh, conception. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe we neglect gravity, maybe uh, we became too affected by uh, uh, virtuality and we, we lost this sense of, of, of you know, of heaviness, a heavy architecture. Heavy architecture, but, but with, a, with, a, with a lofty spirit. Uh, I, I would say often in our time, we build a very light architecture, but with a very heavy spirit. Here we have perhaps, perhaps, I'm not uh, um, you know, saying that it's written in stone, but perhaps we have a heavy architecture, not so much here because of the painting and so on, but I was talking about what we saw before the arrival of, of colors. Um, an, architect, an architecture that is heavy uh, uh, properly speaking, but with a, with a lofty uh, spirit. He was searching for a, for a synthesis of the arts. Uh, that's what he was searching for. And uh, uh, here there are people, actually ladies, uh, contributing to the building of the building. Uh, this is a model of, of the Goetheanum, and this is the building as, as it was built. He was able to infuse 
in people uh, uh, an exuberance, a creative exuberance, which uh, um, is uh, clearly uh, present in, uh, I mean, in order to build such buildings, you do need uh, some impetus, if not faith per, per se, but at least the desire for faith. And these people had it and, 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 and they, they volunteered to build this building. It's in a way amazing that he built about almost 20 buildings and he was not even an architect, he was a philosopher, but very interested in architecture. And you see there is something connecting with uh, Hans Pelzig and with, uh, with the Gothic uh, elements, uh, the Gothicisms of, uh, of, of Hans Pelzig and with a certain so-called darkness or spiritual darkness uh, present in the paintings of Georges Rouault. Concrete, concrete, uh, visceral architecture, quite interesting and convincing. Again, considering it was built not by an architect, but I think he was very good, <laughs> very skillful. Um, yes, I would see here some of the characters of uh, George Ross paintings, climbing the stairs or descending the stairs. Some of them, maybe. Why is it that the architecture today doesn't have most of the time spiritual concerns or spiritual longings or aspirations? Why is it? And equally on the other side, I don't think it has sufficient, sufficiently convincing uh, uh, sensual uh, aspirations. Somehow it's, it's, it's devoid of both. Some furniture by Rudolf Steiner, which is very <laughs> Rudolf Steiner. I mean, is the same uh, uh, person who, who, who built the, the buildings that you saw, who, who designed these, uh, I would say, very impressive uh, pieces of furniture. They are functional, but they are also sculptural. Uh, they are, they are uh, well, they are probably very expensive because this is not plywood. This is, um, you know, the real thing. It's solid wood. But I think they are they are very, 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 very convincing, very well done. And some artworks. He was uh, um, a very interesting uh, man. He, uh, um, you'll see, he he has a whole series of uh, um, uh, drawings done with chalk on blackboards. Uh, sorry, I don't know what this is, the power of thought pictures. Yes, uh, the Rudolf Steiner's blackboards. So he, he designed with, he drew with chalks, uh, uh, you know, conceptual uh, diagrams, but, but they are more, in fact, I almost insulted, insulted them by calling them conceptual diagrams. You will see that they are very interesting, the blackboard drawings of Rudolf Steiner done from 1919 to 1924 knowledge of higher worlds. But you see the knowledge for higher worlds should be uh, accompanied also by the knowledge of the lower worlds. And that's what I meant by when there is spirituality and sensuality. And maybe it's unjust for me to call the sensuality the lower world and uh, spirituality the higher world. The idea is to have both maybe we should abstain from calling them higher and lower because here is already some kind of a judgment. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think we should stay away from these judgments. And here they are in an exhibition. I think it's a very impressive body of work. These blackboards with his uh, tempestuous uh, 
exalted and exalting uh, sketches uh, of, of, of Rudolf Steiner. I like them very much. This, uh, you know, uh, I don't know exactly. I didn't analyze them. I don't have the necessary knowledge, but graphically they incite me. I think they are very interesting. They are indeed about uh, uh, marrying art with science or spirit with science or creating some kind of a spiritual uh, science. Um, and uh, you can tell that there is a cosmic uh, uh, component, so to speak. There is something that transcends, um, you know, uh, the immediate uh, reality. He was he's, he was questing for whole for wholeness, and um, maybe I will talk more about him on the twenty seventh of, uh, of February when his birthday will be. Arta și cunoașterea artei in Romanian. Um, anyway, yes, it is about uh, art, but it's also about knowledge. I, I love his chalk drawings. I, I think they are excellent. I mean, graphically excellent, artistically excellent. It does, it does, the, this, these works do show uh, 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 the ability to conceptualize intellectually, but also to express emotionally. It's clear that, that he lived very intensely and these works show it. After all, between what is happening within us and what is happening outside of us is a close relationship. That's why I say all the time we talk about the environment, but, but there is also a, a, a so-called environment within. There is a nature outside of us and there is a nature within us. And between the two is a, is a, is a, is a, a relationship, a strong relationship, sometimes troubled, sometimes less troubled, but they, they are related, they reflect each other in a way. That's why when I say, when I hear people, you know, we have to take care of nature, I would say, yes, of course, but, but, but there are two natures, is the one outside and is the one inside, and we have to take care of both. Anyway, I, I do think we need architects who get inspired by works like this one, for example, Rudolf Steiner, where you have a philosopher who is also a graphic artist and a builder and a builder of furniture, a thinker. Uh, you know, it's about uh, multidisciplinarity, it's about crossing frontiers, it's about fusion, it's about uh, cross fertilization. We are not thought, we are not taught in schools in this way, and I think it's tragic because we become little uh, craftsmen, uh, but uh, yes, you have to know a craft, but you also have to, uh, to know the, to have the ability to, 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 to uh, connect, to connect with other fields. And now uh, I will end, I don't have here auto burning, but uh, um, I could have, let me open auto burning too. Uh, I, I, I have it, uh, uh, just a second. I just didn't open it uh, here, auto burning. Where are you auto burning? No, don't tell me you are not here. I thought I saved it. Uh, just a second. Sometimes I get overwhelmed by my uh, by my own desire to to transcend the frontiers, and uh, and uh, so it's Rudolf Steiner auto burning. Maybe it's here. Let's see. Yeah, 
Yes, here, here, here. Ah. Okay, so uh, because I, I plan to talk about him too, and uh, let's do it then. So this is the third uh, expressionist architect I, I talk about uh, tonight, uh, Otto Barning, uh, a very interesting German architect uh, who, uh, who built a lot of churches. And uh, he is known as, the, as the, the architect of churches. Here he is with, uh, with uh, uh, Le Corbusier. And on the right is uh, actually uh, Hans Scharun, the, another great expressionist architect, German expressionist architect. This is Barning. Uh, and um, we'll see some of his buildings. In the architecture schools, uh, I don't think too many people talk about uh, an architect like him, but that's that's a, a problem, I would say. Some drawings by him. You see even here the kind of architecture that connects in a way with Rudolf Steiner, connects with Hans Pelzig, and connects uh, maybe less explicitly with the mental universe and the graphic universe and the pictorial universe of uh, Georges Rowe. Because it is a uh, it is a world that uh, assumes uh, spirit. Well, uh, this is a church, but it assumes the world of the spirit in certain terms. The terms of uh, 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 you know a certain darkness, the gothic, uh, and uh, the irrational, the the, the expressionist uh, attempt of the architect to connect with the above, but also without neglecting the below the so-called below. Uh, I will not insist, I mean, this is not a presentation about Otto Wagner. I, I, I would go rather quickly, but I, I, I would like to, to have a chance to say a few things about him because I, I see a world that is neglected today and was not neglected by Rouault, was not neglected by Hans Pelzig, was not neglected by Rudolf Steiner and was not neglected by Otto, Otto Barning. Uh, um, I think we can learn something from these people and uh, apply to our time. But I hope I will arrive at, at, at the churches soon. Um, but even here you see certain connections, even with Rudolf Steiner. Uh, it, it's a certain kind of architecture that, uh, that um, today uh, is rather neglected. Now, this is a block of flats. Uh, I will go quickly over it. It's uh, here he had social concerns, not so much. Uh, it, it's a different program, but I hope I arrive at uh, this is a chapel, but it's not so uh, illustrative of, of what I would like to illustrate. Um, anyway. Um, yeah, uh, maybe I should not have gone into this with Otto Barning. Um, <laughs> Maybe it was not a mistake that initially it was not present on my list with a, um, I, I'm searching for cer a certain church and I don't find it now here for some strange reason. Um, I didn't look at this material in, at some time, but nevertheless, you see an architect, yes, he built many churches, but not all of them illustrate my point, unfortunately. There are two of them which do. Uh, like, for example, here in a certain way, you know, it, it, it is a quest for spirit. It is a quest for the, 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 the spiritual um which a church is supposed to be. Uh, and uh, that, that explicitly, we don't do it very often. Maybe Imre Makovic in, in Hungary did it to an extent, but with some problems too, because it became a little bit too folkish, what he did. Um, in my opinion, although he was influenced by Rudolf Steiner. Look at that tree, how it grows from within the building, or I mean, from the other side, imagine it's some kind of a, a strange, no, it, it, it seems it grows from the inside towards the outside. Um, anyway, um, a glorious tree, though. <laughs> uh, Yes, I think we had enough with Otto Barning. I still don't understand why I didn't arrive at that uh, church I wanted to arrive at. Uh, uh, anyway, 
Uh, no, no, I will continue now with uh, with auto burning. Uh, this this is a, a presentation that seems to be a little bit uh, um, you know, not sufficiently organized and maybe it's true. Uh, this tower though, this tower connects with uh, Hans Pelzig and connects also, I would say, with, uh, with uh, Rudolf Steiner. And it connects also, I think, with, uh, with um, um, uh, Rouault because it has, I would say, a certain mysticism. It's just a water tower, but you see, it's like a mask. Uh, it's a silhouette with a, with a mask at the top. And it's something anthropos, let's say, sophical. In, in this building, which is just a water tower, but but it has a certain physiognomy that uh, makes me connect it with um, with what I mentioned uh, before. It's an interesting building, actually, and I'm happy it's still uh, alive. Now I don't know what is here. Ah, it's a, another church. No, that's not what I wanted to see. Um, uh, this is another church. The expression is, but but the expressionism of auto burning is not uh, truly illustrating what I wanted to illustrate. Anyway, um, now we go through it, and at least uh, the last part of of this presentation tonight uh, is uh, <clears throat> will will create some kind of a balance because <clears throat> I began uh, uh, presentation is just a beginning about what I call erotical architecture because of the dualities present in Georges Rouault, spirituality and, uh, uh, and sensuality. Another church, but um, not as, uh, as uh, illustrative for what I wanted to show. Anyway, um, I mean, he's a, an interesting architect, but uh, I don't, now that I look at it, uh, at his work now, I don't see it so connected with what I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, there was another church, but I see it's not here. And now I, I will present uh, the last uh, work tonight, which is uh, my attempt at uh, addressing this difficult subject, uh, erotic architecture. It's just a beginning, really. Um, it deserves uh, much more than what I did, but it's a beginning. Because I, it is my claim that architecture today is neither spiritual nor erotical, truly. Yes, there is a lot of vulgarity uh, sometimes and mimicked sensuality, but not truly in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fundamental way erotical. And it's also not spiritual. So in a way, the two extremes are not addressed, neither spirit uh, nor sensuality. Uh, <laughs> There are books, you see, uh, I don't know what this is, you know, erotic architecture. Yes, there are all kinds of, or it was an exhibition or something like this. Of course, there are elements of eroticism, but I think that that kind of eroticism, which can be felt uh, near uh, temp uh, the temple of Hera, Hera's temple at Pestum in the south of Italy, where it was said that uh, uh, if an infertile couple spends a night there, they will become fertile. That kind of, of, of uh, primordial uh, uh, eros is absent today. And is absent because, because we don't value any longer the earth in mystical terms. We don't think when we, when we pour the foundations of a building, nobody understands these days that we are perhaps committing something sacrilegious. The ancients, when they did something like this, they, they had a feeling, an immense feeling <clears throat> of guilt because they were uh, raping the earth. That's what the ancient men thought, that when they, you know, they create the foundations for a building, they rape the earth, they rape Mother Earth. But no architect today would think in these terms. No, we have no problem to ravage the earth. Uh, as if the earth is, you know, this, this uh, insensitive matter that we have all the rights in the world to do whatever we want with it. I don't think it's like this, <clears throat> because we lost our wonderment vis-a-vis -vis everything, vis-a-vis -vis the sky, vis-a-vis -vis the earth, vis-a-vis -vis ourselves and vis-a-vis -vis each other. And uh, as I said, the paintings of Rouault have both a dark sensuality and maybe also a dark here and there luminous spirituality, but but they are both. 
we don't handle these so-called extremes. We are not interested in spirituality in architecture, uh, strangely maybe even when we build churches, and we are not interested in that dark, earthy, humid, uh, primordial uh, uh, eroticism that uh, the ancients perhaps uh, knew something about. Now, of course, we have eroticism here in Oscar Niemeyer, uh, you know, rather convenient and graphic with a redness and with a sinuous lines and so on. Of course, this eroticism has to be sublimated. It has to be abstracted. But I also think it has to be earthy. It has to be raw. And, uh, and um, his architecture is interesting, but it seems a little bit otherworldly or a little bit science fiction, a little bit too slick, but it has virtues. I think it qualifies to an extent to be called erotic architecture. This one, uh, yes, of course, the Baroque uh, is good at this, you know, because of this, uh, its curvatures and, uh, you know, the, the voluptuousness of the forms and the spaces and so on. Yes, the Baroque in general, uh, I would say it's, uh, it's uh, conducive or was conducive to expressing certain levels of sensuality. Now, here you see a project by two young architects from Canada. Uh, uh, they submitted this work for a competition I launched uh, some years ago, a house for Lady Gaga. And uh, <laughs> I think they even have their own office called something, something with erotical uh, architecture or something like this. Anyway, this is unfortunately the pictures, so you must excuse them uh, I, in, in the hurry to, 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 to create this, uh, uh, this short presentation. I, I, uh, I didn't have time to enlarge the text and the images, but you'll have a feeling. In essence, it's about a cube, almost like in a, in a, in a uh, landscape uh, designed by André Le Notre. But inside the building, you see Lady Gaga there, uh, you know, spreading her legs and, uh, you know, kind of like a new Athena uh, Parthenos or Athena Palace, you know, the, the new goddess, the goddess uh, who, who is uh, uh, central uh, into a kind of a new temple. Now, the new temple in their case is just a cube with many windows, but the idea to place a huge uh, human body or in this case, a female body uh, you know, there uh, in a very explicit kind of position says something about what they wanted to, uh, to say. And here you see the perspective drawing. It's an interesting idea, though, to, to bring back the goddess or the god, even in scandalous uh, uh, postures. It's okay. It's, it's, it's transcending the human, actually. I mean, yes, Lady Gaga is a human, but uh, she achieved the status of some kind of, you know, super, uh, I mean, she is after all a so-called superstar. And so he, they try to illustrate her, her status uh, in, the, in the present culture in this way, in, 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 what they, in what they proposed. Now, I ask my question, how would a promiscuous architecture look like? because the paintings of, of Rouault depict uh, sometimes prostitutes. So could we have a promiscuous architecture? What would that be? I searched, there are no examples, but, but uh, we can see, uh, yes, uh, un, I mean, not intentionally uh, made or designed promiscuous architecture, but examples of promiscuous architecture uh, unintentionally built uh, can be found in any place in the world probably. Usually um, uh, the periphery, the darkness of the evening and some unglorious uh, quarter of a certain settlement. What about a lascivious architecture? Well, even here I couldn't find examples convincing enough. But Jean-Jacques Lecoeur, who is associated often with uh, Le Doux and Boulet, but he's let, less known that, uh, Le Doux, than Le Doux and Boulet, he made some uh, scandalous uh, drawings. He was an architect and uh, his drawings are very fantastic and, uh, and sometimes very charged uh, erotically. Like for example, here, you know, uh, it, it remained just a drawing, just an, an illustration, but it is an attempt to, 
bring, bring uh, um, arrows into the building. Uh, yes, at the level of an illustration and nothing more than that. But, but the attempt is there. Uh, here even more, this is a symbolic drawing which tries to, which attempts to achieve what uh, Rouault, uh, let's say, I, I would hesitate to use the word achieved, but, but uh, uh, was able to make in his paintings, because here we have sensuality, but we also have spirituality, because she is a nun, but at the same time we have uh, perversion, because Le Coeur, uh, had uh, maybe a, a strange, uh, um, you know, uh, psychology or something, uh, but but the attempt I think is is correct. Even Lady Gaga, because I showed before, she I think in in uh, I forgot exactly what uh, uh, was it in Alejandro or uh, uh, sometimes she she even dresses as a nun, some kind of a sensuous nun. And yes, you could say she's sacrilegious, and sometimes perhaps she is to an extent. Uh, but uh, the attempt is to unite spirituality, sometimes with a dark, uh, or with a darkness about it, or with a sign, minus sign in front of it. Maybe, maybe, and also sensuality, uh, spirituality and sensuality, like here. And uh, it looks like uh, now. Now I'll show you a project which I found on uh, on Sucker Punch Daily towards a promiscuous object. And it is an architectural project, but it is called object, maybe correctly. I, I usually hesitate to use the word object in order to describe a building because a building, in my opinion, is more than an object and should be more than an object. And here it is. Uh, it's something uh, above a highway. Uh, what can we say? It is a type of possible architecture that uh, has a certain level of, uh, you know, viscerality. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, it's called it's called promiscuous because it has uh, elements of sensuality derived from. You see here the the the. the the inspiration for the project now, of course, there is the inevitable strawberry and uh, all kinds of other things here. Uh, and uh, yes, the, most of them deriving from the vegetal world, but uh, from from the you know fruits and, and, and vegetables. Uh, it, it's the it's the the agitation of the the, the ferments of nature that uh, generate this uh, connection with. Uh, what what is named here promiscuity and this is the building uh, you know uh, there are other architects especially with uh, working with Maya you can uh, do all kinds of things kind of similar even more uh, uh, let's say uh, sensuous or uh, um, you know uh, enticing in, in, in this way the section and the elevation, though, is, I think, uh, properly uh, illustrated what I would like to be able to, to, to suggest, that it's possible to do an architecture that is uh, um, charged, so to speak, erotically, but ideally should also have a, a, a spiritual component. So if you could do both, if, if, it's not easy because it is about uniting the opposites. Conjunctio oppositorum. Okay, I, I finished for tonight. Um, maybe it was not the most inspired uh, presentation I made, but it was a difficult, uh, uh, difficult subject.